I want to welcome you all to the fourth edition of Story Maps Live. We're really excited to have our featured storyteller, Kathy Carroll. Uh, my name is Ross Donahue. I'm on Esri's Story Maps team, and I'm going to be the host for this webinar. Um, the general structure will be um, as follows. We'll start with a brief introduction to Story Maps. Um, then we'll hear from our, our featured story uh, teller, Kathy Carroll. And then um, we'll do a live demo of the latest enhancements to Story Maps. We'll answer questions live. And then um, we'll provide some resources and links for folks to keep learning after the webinar. So we're just going to wait one more minute and then we'll get started. A couple of housekeeping things. Please keep your, your audio muted. Just one moment, I'll turn it over to the founder of Story Maps, Alan Carroll, for our introduction. Yeah, great. Welcome, everybody. We're so thrilled to have you. Uh, it looks like we've, we're pushing about 250 people. We had more than 500 sign up, which is just a thrill. Uh, and I know it's, uh, it's a strange and difficult time for us all, uh, which makes us doubly grateful that you could join us. I uh, hope everybody's healthy and that your families are doing well and that you're gonna enjoy the next, uh, next hour or so. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and give you a couple of basics about story maps. Uh, just um, basically what story maps are and then a little bit about how they're being used in lots and lots of different ways. I'm gonna move relatively quickly because uh, I wanna move on to Kathy Carroll. No relation, I don't think, who's gonna, gonna give you some exciting news about story maps and education. Um, at any rate, uh, I hope everybody's seeing my screen, uh, and I'm just going to talk about what a story map is. Uh, so story maps are web apps that combine interactive maps that are hosted for the most part on Esri's online resource, ArcGIS Online, with multimedia content. So in other words, your photos, your videos, audio, etc., and text to tell stories about the world, all sorts of stories about all sorts of different topics at all sorts of different scales. Uh, from pretty much every corner of the planet. They work on a variety of screen sizes, so that means they are responsive. So um, authoring is best done on PCs or large screens, but you can view them just as easily and they look just as great on uh, tablets and mobile devices. Uh, the secret sauce, we think, is that story maps incorporate interactive builders, so you don't need to know any JavaScript or CSS or HTML or anything like that. Basically, if you can do a PowerPoint, you can do a story map. Uh, and the, much, much of the magic lies within uh, what we call the uh, block palette, which uh, we'll also show you um, a little bit of uh, somewhat later. Uh, story maps are hosted by Esri in the cloud, so you don't have to worry about the boring details of, uh, of hosting your, your work. Uh, and we've had an incredible ride over the last few years. I came to, to uh, Esri from National Geographic in late 2010, uh, having no clue that uh, within a few years, we'd be well over a million story maps. We're now actually at about a million and a quarter story maps hosted on our GIS online with many more that we can't count that are behind firewalls and within our enterprise systems. Uh, and they're being used by all sorts of wonderful organizations, uh, individuals and organizations, but lots of, uh, Top drawer nonprofits like National Audubon Society and the Nature Conservancy, uh, federal agencies are doing wonderful work with story maps. NOAA has something like a thousand story maps up and running, uh, EPA even more. Uh, the Library of Congress has a wonderful um, program where they're creating their own story maps about items in their collection. Uh, and the list goes on. I could talk for a long time, but organizations like Smithsonian and USGS and um, um, humanitarian nonprofits and even my alma mater, National Geographic, is increasingly using story maps. Another thing that really excites us is story maps are really, really taking off in the classroom. And in terms of the number, the total number of publicly shared story maps, there are more shared within the education community than by all our other communities combined, which is a, a real thrill for us. Uh, we'll give you more details later on about places you can go for more information. But of course, our you can find our website at esri.com slash story maps. Uh, quickly on to uses of story maps. Uh, this could go on and on, but I've tried to summarize them in, in a few uh, categories. Uh, first and perhaps foremost is uh, story maps for public engagement. So just informing your audience, your friends, your constituents about the work that you or your organization does. This, by the way, is a story map that's live uh, and you can find it on the web. 
uh, and each one of these items has a link to an example story map. Um, a sort of subset of uh, public engagement is activism. So we have uh, um, organizations that are really rallying behind a cause, uh, helping to excite people about a cause and recruit them to action by donating or volunteering, et cetera. And story maps are being used by lots of people for briefings and presentations, just like I am right now. So I'm showing you these, of course, in the form of a story map. And I have uh, quite happily retired from PowerPoint and exclusively, exclusively use story maps these days. Uh, I've talked about education, and Kathy's going to fill you in more about that, so I won't belabor that point. Uh, I love using story maps also as personal narratives, and the, um, they're, they're a wonderful form of, of personal expressions. Every time I go on a vacation, I come back home and my fingers are itching to get my hands on a story map and, and share my experiences, whether it's in Vermont or elsewhere in the world. Uh, story maps are occasionally used by organizations as, an, as online annual reports. Um, the uh, uh, Rotary International did a beautiful one a few months ago. Uh, sometimes, occasionally at least, an organization, we've seen it done by a police department and a conservation organization and some others, they'll introduce their staffs or the, the cops watch, walking the beats around their communities via, via little biographical uh, sketches in story map form. Uh, you can do field guides or guides of various sorts in story map form, whether it's a guide to trees like this one is, uh, or a, uh, a walking tour, uh, trail guide, etc. cetera. Um, another use is as an atlas, of course. So story maps, we love it when they, when they feature maps, especially as sort of star players. Uh, so sometimes when we do a story that's a more narrative form, we'll put the maps together into a separate story just so people can access them, look at them and find, uh, and, and then access the data behind them. Uh, some small organizations are even using story maps as a home page or landing page because they're that versatile. You can embed and include many, many different elements in, in, in your story or your home page. You can use them to promote events. Again, I'm going to move quickly here. Uh, we use story maps a lot to instruct people about story maps or people will, GIS uh, professionals will uh, tout a certain uh, cartographic or analytical technique in the form of a story map. Uh, we've also been excited and have had fun lately um, using story maps. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're back on, Alan. Okay, sorry about this. Uh, I might have uh, accidentally pressed a button or something. Uh, story maps can also be used uh, to show a series of sites or locations. So real estate companies love story maps because, of course, real estate's all about location and our storytelling uh, platform is as well. And then sometimes, increasingly, actually, we're seeing people use story maps as, uh, as resumes um, to, uh, to help find, uh, find jobs in the, in the realm. So Amanda Huber, a few months ago, put together a very nice resume in story, uh, story map form, and she's now, of course, gainfully employed. Uh, I'm going to move on to a little bit more particular uh, set of examples because uh, this difficult time we're in, we feel points uh, all the more to the uh, to the utility and importance of story maps. So we're finding that that lots of people are using story maps in various ways in uh, in response to and in, to help deal with the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, Michelle on our team put together this story map that just uh, puts together some examples and some categories. So uh, uh, local governments and organizations, sometimes hospitals are using story maps to share local planning information, uh, to provide uh, accessible updates about uh, COVID-19. This is a story map actually that our team produced using data uh, continually updated data from Johns Hopkins University that just gives a sort of global overview about the spread of the pandemic. Uh, also to you communicate wellness and safety messages, either uh, internal to an organization or more broadly, how to work from home, how to maintain social distancing, etc. Uh, providing educational resources, so of course, as hundreds of thousands, millions of students are forced to, uh, to learn from home, uh, their story maps can be a very powerful way, as uh, again, you'll soon learn from Kathy of, uh, of, of taking that, of, of, of enriching distance learning. Uh, helping families find healthy food sources or sources of other important uh, resources or information. 
um, explaining data analysis and visualization. Uh, so of course, uh, good access to good data is really vitally important and the GIS community is really coming together on a global basis to provide that data. Story maps and good cartography can help visualize that data and make it understandable. Uh, and helping communities make useful maps, as I was essentially just uh, just describing. We're also finding that uh, that story maps can be a nice way of to, for people to escape. Uh, we we found st uh, doing story maps about places we love to be a, a kind of therapeutic exercise. And uh, with the uh, cherry blossoms recently peaking in D.C., we put together a cherry blossom story map for people who couldn't uh, couldn't make it there. Uh, most everybody can't make it there in person. So again, story maps are not just fun to create, they're important in a bunch of different ways. And these recent days provide perhaps the most vivid possible uh, illustration of that fact. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Ross. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Alan. So now we're gonna to move to my favorite segment of Story Maps Live, where we get to bring a featured storyteller uh, to present their work using story maps and uh, elevate uh, the messages that they're, that they're putting out there into the world. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction to uh, Kathy and then turn it over to her. So Kathy Carroll has been an educator for over 25 years. She currently teaches world history and serves as the social studies vertical team chair at St. John's Episcopal School in Dallas, Texas. She engages students through interdisciplinary digital communities with multimedia classroom projects and historical field research. Last summer, she helped build a digital exhibit for the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum using ArcGIS story maps. The the exhibit, entitled A Right to the City, tells the evolving story of Washington, D.C. neighborhoods through historical records, photos, and personal accounts. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Kathy is using ArcGIS story maps to create meaningful digital learning experiences for her online classroom. Join me in welcoming Kathy uh, to the call. Hey, Kathy, how's it going? I think you're still muted. Muted, hi, how, are, how is everybody today? I hope you are all well. Um, I just wanted to encourage all of you who are out there who are new to story maps, um, that this is something that you can really do. Um, I came to story maps through an internship um, through George Mason University's uh, Digital Public uh, Humanities Certification. And that led me to an internship at um, the Smithsonian Anacostia Museum to produce um, an educational project um, with Paul Perry, their director of education, to try to reach out to DCPS schools. Um, and we wanted to do something that could be used as a pre-visit um, opportunity for teachers to share and preview a collection. Um, and then also to think about how we could give the exhibit a life um, after it closed. Um, clearly this exhibit is giving, um, the digital exhibit is giving it life when um, we're all in such home isolation. I'm here with um, my three kids and husband and we're doing lots of different things right now. So um, wanted to just, um, talk a little bit about um, the process for you know how I came to how I came to story maps when we started talking about creating a digital exhibit we I knew um, as an intern and somebody working remotely and not a Smithsonian employee but an intern um, that it needed to be something that was manageable and so I landed on story maps I had had um, some exposure to it in the older version um, Anita Palmer had come to our school to do a teacher training. And so when I pitched that idea, um, the Smithsonian immediately reached out to the team at Esri, um, had a call with Alan Carroll and Grayson Harris and some others um, who really helped give me a vision, um, given, give me a vision for the project. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, 
share my screen right now so that you can see. Is everyone able to see that? Um, not yet. There we go. There we go. All right. Awesome. So um, this is the Smithsonian Anacostia Museum website. Um, they're located in Southeast Washington, DC. Um, and you notice that they are closed, um, but they have this, um, the digital exhibit that um, links directly from their website. And, um, you know in terms of creating this i think the idea uh, that alan talked about um, using those content blocks um, was really key in helping to um, create this it, it offers a lot of um, plug and play opportunities so content that you already have um, so this is the initial landing page um, for a right to the city and it talks about six different neighborhoods in DC that um, have experienced um, different ways that the citizens of those of those neighborhoods were able to um, band together and use civic activism um, to create um, more just situations for themselves. Um, so kind of the process that I went through um, to do this was um, to think about wanting to, you know, what did I have to start with? And so um, I started with an excellent exhibit guide um, that Samir Magelli, the curator um, of the exhibit and at the museum developed. And um, I wanted to really be able to use story maps to tell these, you know, fantastic stories of these DC neighborhoods. But I knew that it was gonna take a, a, you know, some editing and some curating it for the digital um, digital environment, and really to think about breaking it into smaller pieces, um, so that instead of having one giant story map, and also thinking about it from an educational standpoint, that we really wanted to preserve um, all of the great information and primary sources, um, to um, think about how to um, split it into different collections. So um, what you see here is um, the landing page that we were just on, a right to the city, but that each different neighborhood and then the conclusion is um, broken into a different story map. Um, so the wonderful way, and it was great to be part of the experience of them developing this last summer, um, is that you can scroll through these different neighborhoods. Um, they all work together um, as a way to um, navigate. So um, let me take you through the collections feature lets you navigate through the different neighborhoods so that we're now moving across the story maps. Um, you can also then move down um, Anacostia, which is where the museum is located. Um, this is one of my favorite stories. And um, you can see how we added, we were able to use maps and other content on the Esri platform to kind of show some things that um, weren't necessarily um, included in the original exhibit because um, there was just limited space. Um, but it goes through and it tells these rich stories, different types of content block help you to highlight um, different things. The quotation feature is one of my favorites, um, you know, to highlight the different things that people have to say and pulling quotes out of the exhibit. Um, and then this story of um, a group of of people who are banding together, uh, the Band of Angels, to advocate for better living conditions in their neighborhood. Um, the Rebels with a Cause, a youth organization that um, lobbied for a swimming pool to be built in their portion of the city. And so I think it really highlights what, um, what people are able to do 
when they band together. And I think that's really um, important to think about, you know, in the times that we're, that we're in and the ways that we can all help each other out. Um, so the other neat thing is that you can scroll down just a little bit further um, for museums. You know, these were pieces that um, were part of the original exhibit um, that were on a TV screen in the original exhibit, but they play really nicely here. And so you can take assets that um, were originally made for your brick and mortar exhibit and, um, and they are able to be incorporated into the story map. So you're able to move next through all the other neighborhoods. There's Brooklyn. And then Chinatown. Um, I didn't know that Chinatown was originally on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue near where the National Portrait Gallery before it moved to its current and much smaller location. Um, and then you move through the six neighborhood Adams Morgan. And then it gives you the opportunity. We made a different individual map for um, the ending of the exhibit. So this really um, mirrors a lot of the content and the flow that was already in place, but we were able to gather them together into a collection. Um, and then um, really walk our viewer through, through the exhibit. Um, and then in the collections tab now, you can get back to it and see it this way. So there are a variety of ways as a teacher um, using this in DC public schools um, during the 12th grade unit um, on DC public history. This topic is really timely for them. And so for a teacher to be able to um, send these links out as um, one giant collection or in terms of being able to, you know, assign different students or different student groups um, individual neighborhoods. So that was another way um, I thought of in designing the exhibit. Um, as uh, Ross mentioned, I am still a teacher. Um, my real job uh, is teaching at St. John's Episcopal School in Dallas uh, near White Rock Lake. And um, I started after having so much um, time in the Story Maps platform. Uh, looking at um, how we might um, start using this in the classroom. And so um, I, like Alan mentioned, have been using um, story maps as a way to um, deliver content for my students. Um, you see up here on the story maps tab, um, you can create store individual stories right here. So these are some of the individual stories that I've created this year but then you can also tab over and then pull them into a collection. So for example, um, ways that I have been kind of uh, pulling stories into my virtual learning collection. Um, this is a story that I did on, um, for my students on the veil of your cord using uh, images that are free to use under a Creative Commons license from the British Museum. Um, and there's a great BBC radio article, a uh, radio podcast um, that I always loved playing for my students about um, the history of how this horde came together. But for sometimes just listening to it, um, they needed to have a little bit of visual. So I was able to take uh, the transcript of that, of that recording and then put it into a story map um, one of the things that I really like, uh, this is a great story. These two, uh, father and son that just happened to find when they were metal detecting one day, a, uh, Viking horde. That's one of the most significant finds. Um, simple maps is a really nice feature. Um, so that when they're reading or listening to this, um, you know, this is a map that could take you two minutes to create and they're just, they're just beautiful. Um, so that's a way that you can use uh, story maps as a visual presentation tool. Now that um, 
we are in a virtual learning environment. I've also started um, using these as lesson plans for my students. Um, I'll, you know, give them instructions in our student management system and then um, to go to the link and or to put it in a Teams assignment if some of you teachers are using Teams or Schoology to do assignments. Um, so this was our first lesson. Um, these are my seventh grade students uh, this year on a field trip that we did on a world religions trip um, and then stopped at the mall for lunch. <laughs> um, anyway, so you can see what a classroom looks like. We are trying really hard to communicate with them really directly about the process as we move to online learning. Um, so this is a story map where I'm really talking to them and trying to reassure them about what their schedule is. It's all in one place. Um, as students were, you know, RenWeb is our content management system. Um, I put in a PDF of the assignment uh, just in case they were unsure about the story maps form. And then this was their activity. Um, but I'm really using a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of um, real uh, specific instructions um, there at the beginning. And then encouraging them to take a break. I uploaded a video into YouTube. Um, of myself teaching um, and then um, giving them some ideas. But you're able to use a lot of different tools um, to mash up um, different things. So a different story map, um, this one on digital citizenship and searching for images. Um, you can include teachers, those of you who use platforms like Padlet, um, I was able to curate a digital citizenship video from Common Sense Media. Um, and so one of their assignments was to take a selfie um, and post on Padlet about what it looked like for them to be in a good um, virtual learning environment uh, in your PJs, in your bed is probably not it. Um, uh, so anyway, um, had them uh, link to created a button which created a link to a padlet and it was really a joy as a teacher to be able to see all of their faces um, before we had video enabled um, so that's a you could i've also put forms in um, so those of you who use google forms um, it's a good way to um, and i can even walk them through the process um, and teach them a little bit about a lesson about copyright and fair use. But those of you teachers who use Google Forms, this has been a really effective way for me to just use Google Forms as a check-in um, for them to click on a button and, you know, how did you feel about the activity today? Um, were you confused? Were you confident? And then that gives me a little bit of a barometer of which students um, might need more help or might need for me to reach out to them more directly. Um, so I can take questions now if you have questions or if there are particular things that, um, Ross, that you'd like to guide me on. Yeah, yeah, we're getting some really great feedback in the chat window. You know, one question that came in was, um, have you used story maps to actually share um, curriculum with other uh, instructors or teachers in addition to providing lesson plans? Um, in order to share curriculum. Right now, I am um, writing curriculum for my students. We're right in the middle of a uh, virtual, um, teaching them to do an oral history documentary virtually. Um, but I will be writing some other lessons um, later on in the month um, that are more specific to, uh, to teachers, yeah. Nice. And then we received another question. Um, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from the act of converting media that's built for a physical exhibit into a digital experience? I think a lot of that has to do with um, some of the thing, you know, the resources that Alan has, and maybe he can put those up there or you can, Ross. 
about how to plan your exhibit or plan your um, plan your story map. Um, in the case of a right to the city, um, following that exhibit guide provided a really nice framework. Um, most of the the content that's written here is is um, is from the exhibit guides. Um, and I think that Story Maps um, does such a nice job of having a bunch of a wide variety of uh, modules like sidecar or slideshow that um, really allow you to build different experiences. Great, thanks. And then um, there's an educator wondering if you've seen any Story Maps for um, math related content as opposed to history or um, some of those other subjects? You know, it's interesting. Story maps, um, I feel like some of my work is some of the first work that is more um, humanities based in education, that a lot of the, the uses for them have been on um, science or math. Um, but this would be a great way to teach math. Great. And then um, we only have time for one more question, unfortunately. We, we might have time at the end for more questions, but uh, let's take this one. Uh, what student characteristics help reduce their learning curve to follow uh, your story maps assessments? And so, <clears throat> Can you read that? Can you say that one more time? Sure. Uh, what student characteristics help reduce their learning curve to follow your story maps assignments and complete assignments? So I think in terms of really walking them through it um, and giving them step-by-step -step instructions, I think it helps to, re I mean, because I am speaking to them directly um, and kind of giving them step-by-step -step instructions of what to do and what they're kind of anticipating what their screen might look like in advance. Um, and that the assessments on Google Forms that I use, um, those could be um, assessments that are graded or like a quiz if you wanted a student to do an online reading and then, and then take a quiz afterwards um, that would be graded. You could do that. The way that I'm using them right now is just more for um, checking in with our students as we are all navigating these new worlds together and just wanting to check in and see how they're feeling and where they're feeling confident and where they might need some extra help. Great, great. Um, just because we've gotten two questions related to this, um, how do you distribute your story maps? to your students? Do you embed them on a website like in WordPress or do you send them directly uh, the URL? Um, I send them directly the URL um, within, so our content management system is RedWeb and then we're currently using Microsoft Teams to um, work together virtually. And so I will post the URL um, you know, the directions in our, in our student management system, RenWeb, um, I'll post it there. And then in Teams as an assignment, um, and I imagine for most places, um, there's a tab there for resources and you can actually paste the link in, but this is a clickable link. So in the, any way that you would share um, content, you know, a web link to a YouTube video, um, you can share them share them here. So that's how I share with my students. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy, and really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, hopefully you can stick around for the next part, which is the live demo. Um, I just put in the chat window some resources to learn more about Kathy's amazing work, um, both her blog as well as the Anacostia um, Community Museum digital exhibit. Um, and I recommend checking that out. Um, there's so much uh, knowledge to be shared uh, between individuals. And um, really join me in thanking Kathy for uh, joining us here today. Okay, excellent. So, 
right now um, we're going to move to our next segment, which is the live demo portion, uh, the live demo portion of our webinar, where we will show the latest enhancements um, and features to ArcGIS Story Maps. Um, can everybody see my screen? Okay. Great. So um, I'm going to start at the very basic. So if you are trying to just uh, create your first story map, um, here are the steps that you would go through. So um, I just have a Google Chrome browser open and I'm going to type in esri.com slash story maps. What this does is it will take you to our landing page. Um, this is where you can learn about uh, ArcGIS story maps, you can explore various um, stories that the story maps community, many of which are on this call right now, have created. And you can see how other people are using story maps. We also have amazing resources for getting started um, with story maps. These are educational resources that could be um, either for you as you um, are just trying to learn the platform or for your students, um, for the educators out there who are um, trying to uh, provide curriculum um, for your students to get started. Um, this one in particular, getting started with ArcGIS Story Maps, is a place where we like to send people who are just um, starting out um, with Story Maps. And we can put that into the chat window um, in a bit. So if you want to get started uh, to author a Story Map, you just click Launch ArcGIS Story Maps. And Kathy showed this a little bit, but um, this is where you manage uh, the story maps that you've created, um, and also where you create collections. Um, collections are a way of packaging up various story maps and other apps um, around a related topic and put it all into one place. Um, and so Kathy did a great job of demoing this, um, showing how you can combine story maps that you've created on um, a specific topic and then show them and share them out with the world. So I just want to quickly show you if you wanted to get started creating your first story map, um, you would just click create story map and then you can see uh, this is the story maps builder where you will author your story. So here you can just simply add a title, You can add a cover image. I've got some um, sea ice content uh, from maps that I've been working on on my desktop just to show you really quickly. And then really that secret sauce that um, Alan talked about earlier is this block palette where you can add various content blocks, anything from text elements, um, graphics, multimedia, and then these rich um, immersive blocks um, that change up the uh, interface and experience for your readers. Now, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to focus on the latest enhancements and uh, show you a story um, that we've already created um, for this latest release of Story Maps. So every two months or so, Story Maps gets enhancements and um, new features. And so what I'm going to do is show some of those uh, latest features to you all. So we're really excited to announce that we now have a navigation bar enabled. Um, so if you're familiar with um, the classic story maps, there was this ability to click on this navigation bar with um, bookmarks to jump to different sections of your story map. Um, so I'm going to go in and show you how to enable this feature. So in the design panel, you'll see that now there's this navigation bar where you can turn it on or off. If you turn it on, what happens is anywhere in your story where there's a heading, um, those will auto-populate here at the top 
where the snap bar is. At any point, you can go in and turn those on or off. Save those edits and um, experiment with what works best for your story. You can always bring them back on if you want, um, just by selecting them and clicking Save. Really excited about that feature. OK, so next, um, I want to show you, we're going to jump down to a different section in the story where we can show another enhancement, which is this floating layout. So a lot of you have asked for this. It is the ability to have one piece of media take up the full width of the, the browser and then have text or multimedia um, lay on top of that. And as you scroll, that material appears and, and changes. And I'm going to show you how to do this just by going to the end of the story and um, creating one of these floating um, immersive blocks. So to do this, you just go to Sidecar. And you'll notice that instead of just this uh, docked panel option, which we had before, we now also have this floating panel option. So I'll just click the floating panel. And you can add text here. You can also add you know, things like images, buttons, um, and other rich content. You can change the positioning of this. Um, you can also um, add a new slide really easily um, and uh, even change the size of this panel. So if you wanted it to appear maybe all the way on the other side, you could do it there. Now, another feature that's really exciting is you can, um, you can now have access to more Living Atlas content. So living, the living, ArcGIS um, Living Atlas is um, Esri's online data portal that anyone with a license has access to. These are authoritative data sets that anyone can use and incorporate into their stories. So you notice that they're um, categorized now and you have access to so much more um, information than you ever had before. So let's just add one to show you how easy it is to incorporate this data in. This is a big feature service, so I might just go with a, uh, a lighter one that's a little bit more friendly for webcasting. Um, this is a data set that shows world population around the world. Um, and so you can just simply scroll to a given location and see population density. So in about four clicks, I have a map that uh, shows that really easily. Now, in addition to having Living Atlas content, there are some new features within Express Maps. Express Maps is a lightweight mapping tool that allows you to add points, lines, and polygons really quickly uh, to um, a map and then incorporate it directly into your story. So let's see. The latest enhancements are you can add text annotations here. And you have the option of changing the background color of it, as well as the line stroke. So if you have, for instance, a, a bit of text annotation like that, you can make it dashed. You can change the background. Here, I'll probably want it to have a lot of contrast, so making it white makes a lot of sense. 
Um, this is also a feature in the arrows where you can change the color as well as having it dashed or, uh, or not. And then you'd simply just click done and it's incorporated directly into your story. Hopefully your express map would look a little bit better than the one that I just made. Cool. Okay, next I'm going to show uh, the enhanced video at adding video experience. So previously you could only add uh, videos from YouTube or Vimeo um, through the link. Now you can add it directly um, to your story. The only limitation is um, a 50 megabyte size constraint. If they're larger than that, we recommend using uh, a third party tool like um, YouTube or Vimeo. But now you have this nice um, viewer where you, know, you can see the video, you can um, turn on and off the audio. And so it's a much better experience for your readers. Um, you might have noticed that this is a, a blue theme. One of the exciting new features is you can now change between a title theme or slate theme. The slate is, has sort of a journalistic look and feel. Um, the title has more of an aquatic ocean feel. Um, and each of those have um, some really exciting uh, graphic elements, like um, the quotes look pretty unique, as well as these um, bars, um, the spacers to break up your content. Whereas in title, you have um, these three, we to the bank, Mr. Pack. Um, which is pretty, pretty exciting. <laughs> so let's see, the last thing that I want to show really, really quickly is I don't I was just muted. There we go. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. Great. Okay, so this is, I saved the best for last, which is the ability to duplicate your story. So if you've created a story map related to, you know, sea ice and you want to share it, um, but you want to, you want to duplicate it so you have another version of it, you simply click duplicate story. Yes, duplicate story, and it will create a copy right into your account. Um, this feature will make everyone's lives a lot easier. Um, the Story Maps team is um, very excited to release this um, and have you all um, start using it um, to improve the work that you guys are doing. So you might be wondering, you know, those are lots of enhancements, what's coming next? Um, so in this segment, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the product roadmap um, so that we can uh, show you how the, the tool is progressing and, and the directions that we're headed in. So like I mentioned, these are the items that were actually just released um, a couple of hours ago. Um, so if you go on to, into your account, um, you'll be able to start playing around with these new features today. Um, I mentioned story navigation, float layout, um, search and use content from ArcGIS Living Atlas, two new themes, new styles uh, for express map annotations, ability to duplicate your story map, as well as a number of other refinements. In future releases, we're developing a swipe block, aud more audio options for integration, um, as well as a, a variety of other refinements. Um, so at this point, I want to open it up for questions um, that you guys have. Um, I know that we've got a couple of my colleagues, um, Sarah and uh, David, have been answering a lot of questions already in the chat window, but we want to give some time for folks to um, submit questions to us via the, the group chat, and um, we will do our best to answer them live 
And if we don't get you an answer live, then um, we will, uh, you know, have those questions on our uh, Story Maps Live website. Okay, so let's see. When might we be able to upload our own backgrounds? Great question. Um, so in future releases, we want to be able to really give readers or authors uh, the keys behind behind the car, essentially, to be able to go in and customize your templates to match your organization's branding. Um, so that's something that is in the works um, and will be coming out um, in the next couple of releases to be able to have more of a customized look and feel for your templates. Okay, future improvement. You know, this is also a great time to tell us um, enhancements or features that you'd like to see within your story map. I see somebody wants to have a custom web map instead of um, the express map, base map, or just a, you know, a, a boilerplate um, base map. Um, that is an enhancement that um, we've been talking about, um, and we will communicate that to the rest of our colleagues um, to incorporate that in. Can multiple people collaborate on a story map simultaneously? This is an excellent question. Um, so currently there's no way to have co-editing uh, capabilities. So like in real time, you can't both be in a story map editing. We recommend um, having one person in the builder at a time. Now you can share your story map um, with, uh, with groups of people. So if, for instance, you have people who are part of um, this, a group, you can publish the story so that anyone in that group can edit it. And this workflow can help um, make it easier for folks to um, have access to um, your story map for making edits. Um, it's also worth noting that um, Story Maps is free for teachers and schools um, K through 12 in um, through Esri's uh, granting program. Um, you simply apply to um, that program and you can uh, get access to all of these tools for free. Um, great. Okay, wow, there's so many, there's great questions coming in. I'm trying to, uh, are the words story map searched by Google? Um, one question is, are the words in story maps searched in, by Google? So one of the enhancements um, to ArcGIS story maps is it, it's um, SEO, so search engine optimization. Um, based off your the title of your story and other keywords throughout your story, um, they will appear um, in Google searches a lot more readily, which will drive a lot more traffic to your stories. Um, we experienced this with one of our coronavirus um, story maps that we published. Um, you know, those those key search terms really helped um, get it in front of a lot of uh, viewers and um, allow people to uh, to digest that content. Um, also, if there are questions for Kathy, I know Kathy is still around. Um, feel free to ask those as well. Okay, the ability to transfer story maps between organizations. Um, great question. Um, right now, we're still working on the best workflow for that. Um, the publish to groups is a great way to be able to um, bring people in from different organizations. Um, so, you know, I was working on a project with the Jane Goodall Institute, and um, they were able to share that with me and, and backwards. 
do you still have a timeline design? Um, right now, there's no uh, timeline feature um, content block. We've, we've used a variety of tools to create timelines for storytelling. That's an enhancement that we'll definitely um, consider for the future. Um, let's see, add crowdsourcing so folks can contribute to a story map. Um, that's a great uh, suggestion. Right now, there's no kind of crowdsourcing, um, a simple crowdsourcing uh, block or template. Um, if that's a feature that you'd like to see, that would be great to hear. Um, right now, we have some workflows to be able to take um, one tool called Survey123 that Esri puts out and have people submit responses that then populate a live web map and the map then becomes your, your kind of crowdsource map so people can contribute data to it. So in some ways it's a bit of a workaround, but um, it also allows you to have control over all these different elements. Um, so we can't wait to see what you create. Really want to say a special uh, shout out to Kathy for taking the time today to share her incredible work with us all. Um, it's really inspiring the work that you're doing and um, I know we've all learned something um, from you. Um, if you want to get the latest story maps news, follow us on Twitter at ArcGIS Story Maps. Um, visit our website esri.com slash story maps to get started um, and read our blog. Um, we are constantly posting new content that could be used um, for you, whether it's in the classroom or just hearing about the latest enhancements. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today. Stay healthy, everyone. We really appreciate all of you uh, joining us, and we look forward to having you next time. Thank you.